Welcome back to the channel. Depending on when you see this, you might be at a thousand subscribers. I know we're really close, but I record these a little bit in advance. So if we have, if not, we'll hold off on our celebration. In any case, I want to get to you down looking at molecular similarity. And over the course of several videos, we've been digging into Python tools that are really designed for chemists to understand the molecular environment or the chemical space. And so we've done everything from looking at tools like PubChem Pi that allow you to scrape PubChem to then creating a list of synonyms and extracting the cast numbers. From there, we can also generate smiles strings or inky strings in order to represent those molecules. But we can also do a lot of things like comparing different molecular structures by converting those molecules into some sort of numerical value. And then even capturing what's going on with the FDA and comparing the efficacy of phenylephrine by comparing that to pseudoephedrine and methamphetamine and looking at their polarity. And then in this video, I want to look at the tannimodal chemical similarity. And this is a very chemifematics way to compare the similarity of various molecules. And I'll show you that in this video. And so in this case, let's say we have a scenario where we want to find an alternative for naproxen. Now there's lots of things we should consider. One of those things would be the molecular similarity of these other molecules compared to that of naproxen, because we know that for many cases, the activity, the safety, the efficacy will be somewhat tied to the structure of the molecule. And like I said, there's other factors to include, but this would be one point to consider. And let's say we have our target naproxen, and then we have this list of other sugars, uh, cholesterol, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, aspirin, some small organic molecules, that may or may not matter, but just kind of add to the variety and diversity of molecules. And we want to store these as a data frame where the index will be the moles. If we look at our data frame, it's going to be empty. And we're going to then fill that with the next cell. So here we have our index, but there's no data. In this case, in the next cell, we will use this little list here, this pcp.getCompounds method to actually go to PubChem and produce the chemical ID information for each of these molecules. When this executes, it now adds a new column to our data frame where we have our index being naproxen, glucose, fructose, and now this chemical ID. And we've shown this in many videos, but this is a compound data type that gives us access to a lot of other attributes as a function of these various molecules. So this next up, we dig a lot deeper into the chemifematics aspect of this project and building on a lot of the tools that we've developed in the previous videos. And, and at this point, there should be a playlist that allows you to watch through these. So if you wanna watch them all in order, um, definitely check that playlist out. And so one of the new imports in this section of the video is this from RDKit, we're importing data structs. And this allows us to take advantage of these various data structures that are generated from converting our compound data type to other forms of data. So I'll show you that in the next cell. And so if we look at this next cell, we can run this pipe method on this function we've just built. And you see we have an additional column called bit FPS. And so this is a fingerprint representation of these various molecules. There are a number of ways to represent this and in another case, and so in a future video, I might show a different representation. But what this CAC TVS fingerprint is doing is looking for various functionalities like single bonds, double bonds, triple bonds, different substituents, and encoding that in this list of numbers. And we can then compare those numbers or these zeros and ones across a wide array of molecules. And so if you look at a single entry, we have this explicit bit vec data type. And so this is why uh, we have to start incorporating new tools just to help us unpack these sorts of data types. And so I've seen this data type a lot with like zip and enumerate where you kind of have to do more to access the data. But once you get familiar with these libraries, it's quite simple. And so one thing we can do, if I want to simplify this structure, let's take advantage of this data structure we've imported. And let's say we want to look at the tanimodal similarity. And so the way tanimodal similarity works is that if we were comparing naproxen and glucose, it will look for where both of these molecules share a, a one or a presence of some functionality that's mapped in this case. And we'll then compare where these molecules differ and give us a score that tells us how similar the overall chemical fingerprints are. 
And so if we were to compare, let's say, naproxen to, let's compare it to itself, just to give us a reference point, you say that this is perfectly similar. However, if we compare naproxen to ethanol, we get a much lower score, near zero, and of course we would not expect these two molecules to be similar at all. And so this gives you some intuition about what this is doing. Now, if you recall in the beginning of this video, we have a target compound. We have this naproxen that we wanted to then compare against this full list of molecules. And so to do that more effectively, then writing this out for each of these, we have now created a for loop that will make that assessment for us and store that information in this similarity dictionary. And so we're going to say for compound in moldf.index, recall that moldf.index is this list here. So this will dynamically update if we were to pass in a longer list or an augmented list of compounds. And so we're going to loop through this list here and then compare the attaining modal similarity for each of these. And so we're going to look in this column and take our target. So in this case, we can just, I can show you what this output is there. This is that data structure that we have to pass in. And we can compare that to the compound that is being looped through and store that value as simval and then add that to our dictionary of similarity values. And so let's run the cell. It runs in almost no time. And if you look at our similarity dictionary, you see that we have our similarity data. So an approximate compared to itself is one. And then we have a list of values ranging from near zero to close to one as it relates to these various molecules. A good way to represent this is to just convert this to a data series. Recall that dictionaries essentially are data series or data series essentially are dictionaries. And so now we have a better way to look at this data. We can sort the values and then we could plot that data, uh, probably best to plot this as a bar plot. And we can see that based on the tandem modal similarity, um, again, the proxy compared to itself would be one, but that aspirin, ibuprofen, and salicylic acid, as well as acetaminophen are all pretty similar. There's a drop off between salicylic acid and acetaminophen. If you look at the opposite end, methanol, ethanol, caffeine are all very dissimilar. We have our sugars that are all pretty close to each other, but you know, far from the proxen. Now, the nice thing about when you start to write these data in a more dynamic fashion, we can also add other types of similarity data. So let's look at cosine similarity. We can run this again, everything stays the same. And now we would be plotting the cosine similarity which also will give us some approximation of the similarity between these molecules. There is a slight shift. You see caffeine is now the least similar, followed by the small organic molecules. The sugars stay together. Uh, there's a slight ordering difference here. And so this gives you a way to now build a similarity data frame based on a wide variety of ways to evaluate these molecules and can help you put together a larger story about the similarity between the proxen and these other molecules. We can incorporate other aspects like molecular weight, solubility, and other factors to this data set to give us a really robust assay. And so in future videos, I'll actually include a larger list of compounds so that you can see how these techniques really scale and how we can then build into other things we've done in other videos, such as data clustering, machine learning, unsupervised learning, and data visualization to tell really compelling stories around this molecular information. If you want to be notified, subscribe to the channel. If you enjoyed the video, like. In any case, I'll see you in the next video. Peace.